University of Cambridge International Examinations International General Certificate of Secondary Education June Examination Series 2017 English as a Second Language Extended Tier Listening Comprehension Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the exam. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the exam. Teacher, please give out the question papers. And when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you are all ready, here is the exam. Questions 1 to 4. You will hear four short recordings. Answer each question on the line provided. Write no more than three words for each detail. You will hear each recording twice. Question 1. A. What two types of cooking does the new restaurant offer? B. Where are the friends going to meet before they go to the restaurant? How about we try that new restaurant in town tonight? It offers combinations of dishes from different countries. It sounds fascinating. Is it like that place your parents went to in the States that offered a mix of American and Mexican cooking? Yes, only this one is a blend of Indian and, from what I've heard, Chinese traditions. It should be great. Shall we meet outside the town hall and walk from there? Well, I'll probably leave my bike near school, so I think by the cinema might be easier for me. That's fine. I'll see you at 7pm then. How about we try that new restaurant in town tonight? It offers combinations of dishes from different countries. It sounds fascinating. Is it like that place your parents went to in the States that offered a mix of American and Mexican cooking? Yes, only this one is a blend of Indian and, from what I've heard, Chinese traditions. It should be great. Shall we meet outside the town hall and walk from there? Well, I'll probably leave my bike near school, so I think by the cinema might be easier for me. That's fine. I'll see you at 7pm then. Question 2. A. Which exhibit in the museum is the man very keen to see? B. What does the woman say is not worth seeing? I hear you're off to the National Transport Museum next week. I went there last summer. There are some interesting exhibits, including buses and trams dating back to the early 20th century. I've read that there's a steam train too, which is what I'm particularly looking forward to seeing. Apparently, there's also one of the first underground trains. You can see loads of other stuff, but I wouldn't bother with a collection of uniforms. I personally found the collection of old photographs more worthwhile, along with a display of posters. Thanks for the advice. I hear you're off to the National Transport Museum next week. I went there last summer. There are some interesting exhibits, including buses and trams dating back to the early 20th century. I've read that there's a steam train too, which is what I'm particularly looking forward to seeing. Apparently, there's also one of the first underground trains. You can see loads of other stuff, but I wouldn't bother with a collection of uniforms. I personally found the collection of old photographs more worthwhile, along with a display of posters. Thanks for the advice. Question 3. A. What do fit tourists try when they visit the Great Otway National Park? B. Which location is particularly recommended for a picnic? 
The Great Otway National Park in Australia features many different landscapes. Many energetic visitors attempt the Ocean Walk, stretching 90 kilometres from the resort town of Apollo Bay. Of course you can step off the trail to enjoy the forests and don't have to cover the entire distance. Birdwatching is popular and there are many photo opportunities. For people who prefer other activities such as a picnic, there are plenty of suitable locations. Some local people recommend the lake if you're looking for complete tranquillity, but a nearby waterfall provides a stunning setting for a picnic, which most visitors consider more attractive. The Great Otway National Park in Australia features many different landscapes. Many energetic visitors attempt the Ocean Walk, stretching 90 kilometres from the resort town of Apollo Bay. Of course you can step off the trail to enjoy the forests and don't have to cover the entire distance. Birdwatching is popular and there are many photo opportunities. For people who prefer other activities such as a picnic, there are plenty of suitable locations. Some local people recommend the lake if you're looking for complete tranquillity, but a nearby waterfall provides a stunning setting for a picnic which most visitors consider more attractive. Question 4. A. What does the speaker say is special about the film? B. What type of film is the director more famous for? The new fantasy film Dragonfire is one of those spectacular films that are probably rather predictable and unoriginal, which won't really surprise audiences familiar with this genre. It relies heavily on special effects, which are admittedly more than adequate. It's the acting that lifts it above the standard of similar films, with the two lead actors almost certainly on their way to better things. The director has done a range of work in recent years, including romantic comedies that made little impact, and the ones that made her reputation. Thrillers, which won a couple of major awards about ten years ago. The new fantasy film Dragonfire is one of those spectacular films that are probably rather predictable and unoriginal, which won't really surprise audiences familiar with this genre. It relies heavily on special effects, which are admittedly more than adequate. It's the acting that lifts it above the standard of similar films, with the two lead actors almost certainly on their way to better things. The director has done a range of work in recent years, including romantic comedies that made little impact, and the ones that made her reputation, thrillers which won a couple of major awards about ten years ago. That is the end of the four short recordings. In a moment you will hear question five. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 5. You will hear a talk given by a woman who attended an unusual football tournament played by robots. Listen to the talk and complete the details below. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Good evening. I'm here to tell you about an exciting event called the Robot Football World Cup that I recently attended. Robot football is the result of five years of scientific research which was carried out after a conference held in October 1992. The annual competition was originally set up in August 1997 and has grown considerably in popularity since then. You may be surprised to hear that robots can play football. The truth is that although their complex computer brains are quite advanced, their skills in playing football are rather basic at the moment. The aim of the annual competition is to promote research into what we call artificial intelligence and to help develop more advanced robots. Ultimately, the organisers of this event hope to produce robots capable of beating a team of human football players. At the moment, 
The robots don't find it easy to stay upright all the time and find it impossible to attempt complicated movements such as changing direction quickly. The robots range in size, with some of them no taller than a chair, while the majority are the size of a small child. Some slightly resemble an adult human, whereas others look like a simple machine with wheels. The robot players have human coaches, who program them from their computers in advance, so the robots know more or less what position to occupy at the start of the match. However, coaches cannot help with any kind of game plan during the match. The referees are told not to be too strict. After all, the robots are as likely to kick each other as they are the ball. Robots now move much faster than they used to and make decisions in a few seconds, so there is some limited independence from human control. Scientists say they will be concentrating on creating new robots that will be able to do things as a result of teamwork, something that is very difficult to achieve now. Although computers have already beaten humans at some games, clearly it will be more of a challenge to construct robots that can match humans in terms of their physical strength and their speed, and above all, their ability to predict the likely movement of the ball won't be easy for them. There are other robot competitions involving a whole variety of activities. For example, some robots take part in challenges to see if they have the skills to clean. This would be great for lazy people. For the moment, asking them to assist people in more complex ways or even rescue people in difficulties is beyond their capabilities. This is a fascinating event. And one day, we might all be sitting down to watch a team of robots take on humans at football. And other sports too. Now you will hear the talk again. Good evening. I'm here to tell you about an exciting event called the Robot Football World Cup that I recently attended. Robot football is the result of five years of scientific research which was carried out after a conference held in October 1992. The annual competition was originally set up in August 1997 and has grown considerably in popularity since then. You may be surprised to hear that robots can play football. The truth is that although their complex computer brains are quite advanced, their skills in playing football are rather basic at the moment. The aim of the annual competition is to promote research into what we call artificial intelligence and to help develop more advanced robots. Ultimately, the organisers of this event hope to produce robots capable of beating a team of human football players. At the moment, the robots don't find it easy to stay upright all the time and find it impossible to attempt complicated movements such as changing direction quickly. The robots range in size, with some of them no taller than a chair, while the majority are the size of a small child. Some slightly resemble an adult human, whereas others look like a simple machine with wheels. The robot players have human coaches, who program them from their computers in advance, so the robots know more or less what position to occupy at the start of the match. However, coaches cannot help with any kind of game plan during the match. The referees are told not to be too strict. After all, the robots are as likely to kick each other as they are the ball. Robots now move much faster than they used to and make decisions in a few seconds, so there is some limited independence from human control. Scientists say they will be concentrating on creating new robots that will be able to do things as a result of teamwork, something that is very difficult to achieve now. Although computers have already beaten humans at some games, 
Clearly, it would be more of a challenge to construct robots that can match humans in terms of their physical strength and their speed, and above all, their ability to predict the likely movement of the ball won't be easy for them. There are other robot competitions involving a whole variety of activities. For example, some robots take part in challenges to see if they have the skills to clean. This would be great for lazy people. For the moment, asking them to assist people in more complex ways or even rescue people in difficulties is beyond their capabilities. This is a fascinating event, and one day we might all be sitting down to watch a team of robots take on humans at football, and other sports too. That is the end of the talk. In a moment you will hear question 6. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 6. You will hear six people talking about learning a new skill. For each of speakers 1 to 6, choose from the list A to G which opinion each speaker expresses. Write the letter in the appropriate box. Use each letter only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. You will hear the recordings twice. Speaker 1 I took up photography last year and attended an evening class. I got on well with my teacher, and since I knew the basics already, I thought I'd have few problems and would improve my skills rapidly. It came as a surprise when I found myself struggling. Photography is quite a technical subject, and at times the instructions and advice didn't make a lot of sense to me. I made plenty of mistakes, though I learnt from them and think it's a natural part of the learning process. Speaker 2 I did some tennis lessons last summer. I don't think I was very serious at first and so I didn't put in the effort that was required if I was going to do well. The result was I made tons of errors, but everyone on the course, including the coach, was so laid back and easy going that I never felt uncomfortable. People cheered me on even when I made a mess of something and this supportive atmosphere was really important and meant I didn't need to get tense or nervous. Speaker 3 I decided to learn Arabic last term because I'm usually pretty quick at picking up new languages. I knew that it was totally unlike the European languages I had studied before. This meant I knew I was going to have to really focus and apply myself. I was up for the challenge, but I still found it tough. Of course, I made lots of funny mistakes, especially with pronunciation, but that's all part of learning a language, and getting things wrong never bothered me. Speaker 4 I come from a very musical family, and my sister in particular has a great voice. I knew I had the ability too, and so had some singing lessons. There was something I had to prove, and that put me under a bit of pressure. My teacher insisted I was making good progress, though I was disappointed that I wasn't doing even better. I probably should have practised more outside class. My teacher gave clear advice on what I should do to improve, but I didn't always take it.
Speaker 5. I went on a skiing course last winter. The instructor was friendly, but she expected us to work hard. Some students were falling over all the time and making all sorts of basic mistakes, despite the clear instructions. At least I managed to avoid making a fool of myself, so I was quite pleased. I must admit that my mind wasn't always on what we were supposed to be doing, and I was easily put off by other things that were going on, like my brother trying to make me laugh. Speaker 6 I'd always wanted to draw, so I was really pleased to find a course. I'd found some books on the subject hard to follow and was worried my teacher might take a similar approach. I was relieved she didn't. In fact, her attitude was that in art there are no mistakes. I discovered that I had a natural talent and so I just raced ahead. Friends and family hadn't been either enthusiastic or critical of my new interest, but like me, they were astonished at my development. Now you will hear the six speakers again. Speaker 1 I took up photography last year and attended an evening class. I got on well with my teacher, and since I knew the basics already, I thought I'd have few problems and would improve my skills rapidly. It came as a surprise when I found myself struggling. Photography is quite a technical subject, and at times the instructions and advice didn't make a lot of sense to me. I made plenty of mistakes, though I learnt from them and think it's a natural part of the learning process. Speaker 2 I did some tennis lessons last summer. I don't think I was very serious at first and so I didn't put in the effort that was required if I was going to do well. The result was I made tons of errors. But everyone on the course, including the coach, was so laid back and easy going that I never felt uncomfortable. People cheered me on even when I made a mess of something and this supportive atmosphere was really important and meant I didn't need to get tense or nervous. Speaker 3 I decided to learn Arabic last term because I'm usually pretty quick at picking up new languages. I knew that it was totally unlike the European languages I had studied before. This meant I knew I was going to have to really focus and apply myself. I was up for the challenge, but I still found it tough. Of course, I made lots of funny mistakes, especially with pronunciation, but that's all part of learning a language, and getting things wrong never bothered me. Speaker 4 I come from a very musical family, and my sister in particular has a great voice. I knew I had the ability too, and so had some singing lessons. There was something I had to prove, and that put me under a bit of pressure. My teacher insisted I was making good progress, though I was disappointed that I wasn't doing even better. I probably should have practised more outside class. My teacher gave clear advice on what I should do to improve, but I didn't always take it. Speaker 5 I went on a skiing course last winter. The instructor was friendly, but she expected us to work hard. Some students were falling over all the time and making all sorts of basic mistakes, despite the clear instructions. At least I managed to avoid making a fool of myself, so I was quite pleased. I must admit that my mind wasn't always on what we were supposed to be doing, and I was easily put off by other things that were going on, like my brother trying to make me laugh. Speaker 6
I'd always wanted to draw, so I was really pleased to find a course. I'd found some books on the subject hard to follow and was worried my teacher might take a similar approach. I was relieved she didn't. In fact, her attitude was that in art there are no mistakes. I discovered that I had a natural talent and so I just raced ahead. Friends and family hadn't been either enthusiastic or critical of my new interest, but like me, they were astonished at my development. That is the end of question 6. In a moment you will hear question 7. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 7. You will hear a journalist talking to a cartoonist called Dan Clifford about his work. Listen to the interview and look at the questions. For each question, choose the correct answer, A, B or C, and put a tick in the appropriate box. You will hear the interview twice. Hi, Dan. Thanks for agreeing to talk to us about your work as a cartoonist. Were you always good at drawing cartoons? Well, I read a wide range of comics as a kid, and just for fun I'd copy them and have a go at creating similar characters. Later I used to produce comic strips featuring family and friends, and which made fun of them. Fortunately, they found them amusing. I took cartoons more seriously when I was invited to do some for my school newspaper, and I started to think I might actually be talented. Was it easy to get a job as a cartoonist with a newspaper or magazine? I would do several comic strips, often in a bit of a hurry, but made to look as professional as possible, and send copies to every newspaper I could think of. I always tried to imagine what would appeal to the readers of the newspaper I was going to contact. I regret it now. I should have stuck with what I enjoyed and found funny, instead of trying to guess what other people liked or what the latest trend was. Some cartoons are just one picture, and others, like yours, are cartoon strips with four or five pictures. Why do you prefer to do comic strips? It's perhaps not fair to compare them because they're so different, but they can be equally amusing. A cartoonist working with one picture and a handful of words is limited in many ways, but even within that framework you can be very inventive. The longer strip has more potential for developing the characters and showing all the different aspects of their personalities. Would you say that being a cartoonist is a tough job? The great thing is the complete freedom I have. So long as I meet all the deadlines, nobody cares when I work or how I work. Sometimes I need to work all day, but I often take a day off if I'm tired. Coming up with new ideas can be a challenge because I don't want to repeat myself and your fans do remember what you've done before. What do you think about the work of other cartoonists today? Well, one problem is that comic strips are often quite small these days and so there is less space for extended dialogue, which is a shame. The other thing is that if you have small pictures, you don't really notice the wonderful background detail, which is the very thing that creates a world that the reader can almost believe is real, just for the minute or two they're looking at the comic strip. When you're working on a cartoon, do you draw and write at the same time? I tend to do these things separately. I find that the writing is the challenging and sometimes exhausting part, and the drawing is more enjoyable. I like to separate the two so I can give my full attention to one or the other and not be distracted. I enjoy devoting plenty of time to the drawing, making each picture as interesting as possible. Are the majority of your comic strips based on things that have happened to you? I can get my inspiration from just about anywhere. 
Sometimes a trip to the local store or a bus journey will give me an idea. But far more likely, it's something that just pops into my mind unexpectedly or when I'm daydreaming. Conversations with other people often give me ideas too. But I prefer to rely on just sitting and thinking, really. And finally, do you think that cartoonists do a worthwhile job? On one level, if I manage to put a smile on someone's face when they might be feeling down, then I'm pleased. But what I hope is that my readers start to feel emotionally involved with the characters and follow them with keen interest. I think that's taking my job to a deeper level. So in the end, it's about more than just coming up with one great joke every day or expressing my opinions about life. Dan, thank you very much for finding the time to talk to us today. Now you will hear the interview again. Hi Dan, thanks for agreeing to talk to us about your work as a cartoonist. Were you always good at drawing cartoons? Well, I read a wide range of comics as a kid, and just for fun I'd copy them and have a go at creating similar characters. Later I used to produce comic strips featuring family and friends, and which made fun of them. Fortunately, they found them amusing. I took cartoons more seriously when I was invited to do some for my school newspaper and I started to think I might actually be talented. Was it easy to get a job as a cartoonist with a newspaper or magazine? I would do several comic strips, often in a bit of a hurry, but made to look as professional as possible and send copies to every newspaper I could think of. I always tried to imagine what would appeal to the readers of the newspaper I was going to contact. I regret it now. I should have stuck with what I enjoyed and found funny instead of trying to guess what other people liked or what the latest trend was. Some cartoons are just one picture and others, like yours, are cartoon strips with four or five pictures. Why do you prefer to do comic strips? It's perhaps not fair to compare them because they're so different, but they can be equally amusing. A cartoonist working with one picture and a handful of words is limited in many ways. But even within that framework, you can be very inventive. The longer strip has more potential for developing the characters and showing all the different aspects of their personalities. Would you say that being a cartoonist is a tough job? The great thing is the complete freedom I have. So long as I meet all the deadlines, nobody cares when I work or how I work. Sometimes I need to work all day, but I often take a day off if I'm tired. Coming up with new ideas can be a challenge because I don't want to repeat myself and your fans do remember what you've done before. What do you think about the work of other cartoonists today? Well, one problem is that comic strips are often quite small these days and so there is less space for extended dialogue, which is a shame. The other thing is that if you have small pictures, you don't really notice the wonderful background detail, which is the very thing that creates a world that the reader can almost believe is real, just for the minute or two they're looking at the comic strip. When you're working on a cartoon, do you draw and write at the same time? I tend to do these things separately. I find that the writing is the challenging and sometimes exhausting part, and the drawing is more enjoyable. I like to separate the two so I can give my full attention to one or the other and not be distracted. I enjoy devoting plenty of time to the drawing, making each picture as interesting as possible. Are the majority of your comic strips based on things that have happened to you? I can get my inspiration from just about anywhere. Sometimes a trip to the local store or a bus journey will give me an idea, but far more likely it's something that just pops into my mind unexpectedly or when I'm daydreaming. Conversations with other people often give me ideas too, but I prefer to rely on just sitting and thinking, really. And finally, do you think that cartoonists do a worthwhile job? On one level, if I manage to put a smile on someone's face when they might be feeling down, then I'm pleased. But what I hope is that my readers start to feel emotionally involved with the characters and follow them with keen interest. I think that's taking my job to a deeper level. 
So, in the end, it's about more than just coming up with one great joke every day or expressing my opinions about life. Dan, thank you very much for finding the time to talk to us today. That is the end of question 7. In a moment you will hear question 8. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 8, Part A. You will hear a teacher giving a talk about an environmental event. Listen to the talk and complete the sentences in Part A. Write one or two words, or a number, in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Good morning, everyone. This morning I'm going to tell you something about World Environment Day, which we hope to celebrate at school next term for the very first time. It was established by the United Nations General Assembly in 1972. They were interested in bringing increasingly serious environmental problems to the attention of the public and suggested identifying one special day in the year, June the 5th, which would be known as World Environment Day. This is not to be confused with Earth Day on April the 22nd, which some of you may be more familiar with. Both days give us a chance to reflect on what we are all doing to protect the environment and to take action. There is a range of activities that can take place on this day, many of them carried out by young people. The day has come to be associated with a theme, for example the planting of trees. It is well known that this has many long-term benefits, such as helping to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases and the damaging effects of strong winds. Above all, it ensures soil erosion is eliminated. Trees also release oxygen and considerably improve the appearance of the local area, especially for people living in a large urban centre. People are advised to think on this special day about even the simplest actions, such as going to the shops to get some basic groceries. We shouldn't, for example, purchase items that come with excessive packaging and certainly not use plastic bags to carry our shopping home. It can be more rewarding and indeed more enjoyable to consider collective action to help the environment. One popular activity on World Environment Day is to remove litter from streets and car parks. This isn't always a pleasant or safe task, so people should wear gloves, which offer some protection. Something to bear in mind when cleaning up the countryside is the need to have suitable footwear and to be systematic in your approach. On a more ambitious level, many students have got together to raise money to support environmental causes they care about. One possibility is to set up an event that generates income for a nature reserve in their area. That way, they might get to see how their efforts can make a difference to wildlife right on their doorstep and preserve precious habitats. Before I move on to discuss other things that we could achieve, would anyone like to ask any questions at this point? Now you will hear the talk again. Good morning, everyone. This morning I'm going to tell you something about World Environment Day, which we hope to celebrate at school next term for the very first time. It was established by the United Nations General Assembly in 1972. 
They were interested in bringing increasingly serious environmental problems to the attention of the public and suggested identifying one special day in the year, June the 5th, which would be known as World Environment Day. This is not to be confused with Earth Day on April the 22nd, which some of you may be more familiar with. Both days give us a chance to reflect on what we are all doing to protect the environment and to take action. There is a range of activities that can take place on this day, many of them carried out by young people. The day has come to be associated with a theme, for example the planting of trees. It is well known that this has many long-term benefits, such as helping to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases and the damaging effects of strong winds. Above all, it ensures soil erosion is eliminated. Trees also release oxygen and considerably improve the appearance of the local area, especially for people living in a large urban centre. People are advised to think on this special day about even the simplest actions, such as going to the shops to get some basic groceries. We shouldn't, for example, purchase items that come with excessive packaging and certainly not use plastic bags to carry our shopping home. It can be more rewarding and indeed more enjoyable to consider collective action to help the environment. One popular activity on World Environment Day is to remove litter from streets and car parks. This isn't always a pleasant or safe task, so people should wear gloves, which offer some protection. Something to bear in mind when cleaning up the countryside is the need to have suitable footwear and to be systematic in your approach. On a more ambitious level, many students have got together to raise money to support environmental causes they care about. One possibility is to set up an event that generates income for a nature reserve in their area. That way, they might get to see how their efforts can make a difference to wildlife right on their doorstep and preserve precious habitats. Before I move on to discuss other things that we could achieve, would anyone like to ask any questions at this point? Question 8. Part B. Now listen to a conversation between two students about celebrating World Environment Day and complete the sentences in Part B. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the conversation twice. I thought that talk about World Environment Day was inspiring. I've been thinking quite hard about what our class could do and I've come up with some ideas. Yeah, I've given it some thought too and was reading some stuff online about what schools in other countries do. I know our teacher will want us to study something in depth first though. Well, I was chatting to her about it the other day and she suggested that everyone could select a particular region of the world or an endangered habitat and take detailed notes or we could instead examine one of the environmental problems caused by global warming. You know, something like water shortages. It could be anything that interests us, but she said it's best to leave CO2 emissions because she'll be covering that. That sounds like a good idea. Do you think we'll have to write a report for her based on all this research? We usually do a presentation, but a short film would be more creative. Yes, and that would really impress our teacher because nobody else has done that. But there are more practical things we can do as well as our background research. OK. I've read about students in other schools laying out little gardens somewhere in the school grounds. Yes, that would be quite fun. Even a small garden encourages biodiversity because it's sure to attract quite a lot of wildlife. We could even have a bird feeder. That would liven things up. The other thing is that we could grow our own vegetables. Right. And that brings me to another idea I've heard about. Some students have a little party and prepare a meal for their classmates. Of course, I suppose the crucial thing is you should use vegetables grown locally, nothing flown in from the other side of the world. I like that idea. World Environment Day shouldn't just be about doing academic stuff. I totally agree. And if we're going to have a party, we need some music. 
I found some great music online that was produced for World Environment Day. The song lyrics are worth looking at carefully, I reckon. Yes, we can see what messages are being conveyed and then have a go at singing them. Well, maybe. You've got a better voice than me, so I might leave that to you. Now you will hear the conversation again. I thought that talk about World Environment Day was inspiring. I've been thinking quite hard about what our class could do and I've come up with some ideas. Yeah, I've given it some thought too and was reading some stuff online about what schools in other countries do. I know our teacher will want us to study something in depth first though. Well, I was chatting to her about it the other day and she suggested that everyone could select a particular region of the world or an endangered habitat and take detailed notes. Or we could instead examine one of the environmental problems caused by global warming. You know, something like water shortages. It could be anything that interests us, but she said it's best to leave CO2 emissions because she'll be covering that. That sounds like a good idea. Do you think we'll have to write a report for her based on all this research? We usually do a presentation, but a short film would be more creative. Yes, and that would really impress our teacher because nobody else has done that. But there are more practical things we can do as well as our background research. OK. I've read about students in other schools laying out little gardens somewhere in the school grounds. Yes, that would be quite fun. Even a small garden encourages biodiversity because it's sure to attract quite a lot of wildlife. We could even have a bird feeder. That would liven things up. The other thing is that we could grow our own vegetables. Right. And that brings me to another idea I've heard about. Some students have a little party and prepare a meal for their classmates. Of course, I suppose the crucial thing is you should use vegetables grown locally. Nothing flown in from the other side of the world. I like that idea. World Environment Day shouldn't just be about doing academic stuff. I totally agree. And if we're going to have a party, we need some music. I found some great music online that was produced for World Environment Day. The song lyrics are worth looking at carefully, I reckon. Yes, we can see what messages are being conveyed and then have a go at singing them. Well, maybe. You've got a better voice than me, so I might leave that to you. That is the end of question 8, and of the exam. In a moment, your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number, and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, please collect all the papers.